it's been one year since um, that incredible tornado ripped through Pumpkin Hollow and um, touched down in other parts of Conway. Um, hard to believe a year has passed, and hard to believe we had that happen here. Um, I still remember that sort of punch in the gut feeling of walking over to Pumpkin Hollow and just seeing the devastation that first time. And just not believing this is our town, that this happened here. I, Maybe I grew up watching Wizard of Oz too many times as a kid and thought like, tornadoes just happen in that flat middle part of our country and don't happen in New England. But, um, but indeed, we do have tornadoes here. We've had uh, three dozen tornadoes in Pioneer Valley since 1950, which I was surprised. You know, most of them are small, but they do occur here. Um, and we've had major hurricanes in this, in this state. Um, in 1953, in June, a tornado, sorry, I think I said hurricanes, I meant tornadoes, um, a tornado in Worcester uh, killed 94 people, um, 10,000 people were homeless. So we've had major tornadoes that have done incredible damage in the state before, which I also didn't know. Um, so it is, it is something that can happen, and it's something that can happen again. Um, it, it was unusual in that it happened in February. We've never had a tornado in February in Massachusetts. And I think in most parts of the country, they don't tend to occur this time of year. So today we have a chance to reflect on this event on a year that's passed. Um, that's a main reason we wanted to have this program. But also, we wanted to do this so we can add to the historical record. Um, Conway's had a lot of natural disasters in the past, uh, mostly floods and fires and um, some hurricanes. It's hard to find information on those as historians looking back into the record. We have the newspaper record, but we don't have a whole lot else. We don't have a lot of first-hand accounts. Back then, people did write about them in letters and diaries. People don't really do that anymore. Most of you probably emailed somebody about the tornado when it happened a year ago. But who among us is saving those emails? You know? So the next Dean Lees to write the next history of Conway, what are they going to be dealing with as their primary sources? So part of our effort today is to get people on the record, people talking about their experience another way of, of sort of building a file on this event so people in the future can, can learn more about it. Um, so with that, this is, these kind of things are momentous events, I think, in the history of a small town like that. And it's a, it was an incredible time when the town came together. And I think we have a lot of different aspects of what happened that we can discuss today. And I want you all in the audience to feel free about asking questions and being part of the discussion. We're going to hear from some of the residents of Pumpkin Hollow, and they're going to speak from the order they live in from um, south to north, and basically the, the path of the tornado. Um, and they're each going to speak for a little bit about their experience that night. We're going to look at some video footage after that. Um, and then it's really opened up to everybody. If you want to share your experience about the tornado hitting down in other parts of town and, and what you were thinking that night, and. Um, damage you might have had to your property, um, talking about how it's something that we remind ourselves all the time in this past year that nobody was hurt that night, which is pretty miraculous. Um, it's worth saying that <laughs> over and over again and reminding us how unbelievable that is when you look at some of the damage. Um, so we're going to um, hear from, from everyone, see the video, talk some more. And I guess I should introduce everybody. Um, so John Maggs is here, uh, Steve Thomas, Grant Engel, Steve Schneider, and Kevin McDonald. And do you want to start us off, John? Sure. And thank you all, too, for agreeing to talk. And appreciate it. Well, to counter a tendency to go on and on, I'll, I'll be reading. <laughs> you might be grateful. Uh, a year ago tonight, before finishing the craft beer that had delayed our trip to our office in the barn and probably saved our lives, Jan and I walked outside to assess. Oh, yeah. Jan and I walked. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm also not well. Uh, Jan and I walked outside to assess whether the trees around us had survived the powerful wind we had just heard while we sat in darkness in our kitchen. We couldn't see our favorite maple tree. But when I aimed my flashlight towards the barn, I discovered that it had been transformed into a pile of rubble. Our business, inventory, family heirlooms, kids' belongings, and the overage of life's essentials were scattered about and were being drenched by rain. Three decades of work to preserve and improve Jabez Newhall's barn 
in Conway's historic center had just ended. We had a sleepless night, punctuated by visits from Conway's heroic first responders. When we rose on Sunday morning, our future stretched before us, as uncertain as it had been in our youth. While we tried to assess the damage, a small army of friends, neighbors, and family began to appear. They came to help. And this outpouring of community is perhaps the most vivid and overwhelming memory we have of those first hours. Over the next few days, others came as well. We were offered space in a nearby hay barn to which much of what could be salvaged was taken. As we recall those first few days, there are things we remember. These are the things that we remember. And we'll never be able to summon words to express the extent of our gratitude to all who came. Our thoughts then shifted to the future. Two things became obvious to us. First, we would continue in business, although it would certainly take time to recover. Much of our inventory was lost, and most of what remained needed repairing, and we no longer had space to make those repairs. Second, we felt an obligation to replace Jabez Newhall's iconic barn with a structure of similar significance. Within a few days, with the help of friends whose knowledge of these things is greater than ours, we had begun to make plans for the barn that is now rising in Pumpkin Hollow. It would be no replica, but a new structure, built to 21st century standards, but with a visual and structural connection to Pumpkin Hollow's 18th century past. As you might correctly assume, the new barn comes at a huge cost. Fortunately, our insurers have agreed to underwrite most of the cost of the building. What the future holds for us in terms of its operation is less certain. Time will tell. After an initial series of administrative delays, the project is now moving quite quickly towards completion. We're looking forward to holding our inaugural show in the new barn on May 5th and 6th. All are, of course, welcome but we also plan to hold an open house of some sort for non-antiquing Conway residents <laughs> during the summer. The date of this, of this event will be announced on our website, jmags.com, and in local media. Jan and I are looking forward to sharing the new home of our business with the residents of Conway and beyond. I'd like to follow the pattern that John has laid out. The night of the uh, tornado, um, the transition period, and uh, the rebuild and beyond. So, um, my wife and I were having a dinner party that night, um, just finishing a yummy dessert, when all of a sudden our side door um, blew in rather robustly. Um, my brother-in-law, Roy, and I got up to, you know, try and close it. This happens once in a while when it's windy. And we were just starting to get control of the door when all of a sudden my brother-in-law got thrown about six feet uh, into the room behind it. And uh, it was a big bang and uh, the lights went off, the fire uh, alarms were buzzing. And uh, we realized that this wasn't just another... Uh, brief storm. Um, anyway, um, the guests uh, didn't know what was really going on, you know, it was windy outside and everything, but uh, we got out some flashlights and lit some kerosene lamps and uh, um, tried to uh, keep the fire alarms quiet. Um, it wasn't until about 10 or 15 minutes later when the uh, guests were starting to leave um, that we realized that the uh, older part of our house that was 1860s vintage was uh, very severely damaged. I, I have a pocket door that separates the timber frame part which I built about eight years ago from the older part. Um, fortunately the timber frame part where the dinner party was uh, was uh, completely unscathed but the other part uh, I looked up and 
I could see rain coming down in the sky, and I said, something isn't quite right. <laughs> anyway, um, that's what happened. Luckily, uh, none of the guests were hurt. Uh, their cars were, other than a couple uh, minor dents in the bodywork, were fine, and um, off we went. So we went into the old part of the house that had been destroyed, and it was uh, just completely trashed. It was raining that night, so the drywall was absorbing water, which uh, a drywall isn't intended to do. And, uh, so that was the evening of the tornado. So the next uh, day, we uh, assessed the situation, um, uh, tried to figure out what the next move was. And it was pretty clear to me um, that the whole older part of the house had to be completely torn down, um, which happened to be uh, how it unfolded after the insurance people and uh, frame engineers went through and assessed it. So the next uh, thing was to uh, rebuild it. We wanted to keep the same basic footprint, uh, which we've done uh, and started that long and lengthy uh, process. Um, as I went through the rebuild, um, I did some of the work, I had some other people come in and do some of the work. Um, there was something that uh, really helped me, and breaking off the beaten path here, I'd like to play a CD that I played 50 to 80 times during the many month long uh, rebuild. So uh, bear with me, I hope I can get the sound box to make some noise here. And, uh this is Ella Pickett and her gospel group out of Toledo, Ohio. Steve would come over, and every time he heard this, we'd both wave our feet up in the air. <laughs> I think you get the gist of it. <laughs> uh, we went through the rebuild, and uh, the two things that impressed me and everyone else I think here is the, uh, the way the community came in, first responders and everyone else, uh, the volunteer groups, uh, uh, Farmers Women's Auxiliary that raised uh, money that helped, uh, in my case, remove some of the six trees that had uh, gone down. Um, that was really impressive to me. Um, equally impressive to me was <coughs> Um, how much we take for granted. We say, oh yeah, we go to the house, but you try and live without a house or a competent roof over your head, um, and uh, you'll really appreciate uh, what an important thing a house is. And you, being in a community like this, you really appreciate what a community is. All the people who come for it. Sorry, I start choking up when I talk about this stuff because I was so impressed by it. And uh, the third thing I'd like you to consider is uh, in a world that doesn't live out there, except in Conway, um, you have to appreciate the incredible job that the volunteers do. Let's suppose we went back to that uh, night of February 25th and there were no volunteers that make this town what it is. Just imagine what would happen. We'd be there in the dark and wondering what was going on. Um, so the point I want to make with this thread is um, the town really depends on volunteer people. Doesn't matter what you do, you put in an hour, a year, month, day, that's the glue that uh, keeps Conway Conway. 
so without me starting to break out in tears, I'll pass it on. <laughs> Our home and properties are diagonally across Pump, uh, Waitley Road in Pumpkin Hollow from Steve. And I don't remember the pre precise time that it hit. I thought it was somewhere around 6, 6.30. Channel 22 was on. The TV blinked once. We were in the northwest corner of the, in, where the TV is. My wife had gone to the kitchen. And I thought I was back at an artillery range with the debris and the sound. The sound of a train is true. If I ever hear it again, I hope to God I'm near the railroad tracks. <laughs> it was awesome. It, it, the power is immense. And I hollered to her, get in the doorway. I had heard, I'm not from the Midwest or Tornado Alley, but uh, the shoring up and the framing of doorways gives you protection from debris coming down. So I said, Eileen, get in the doorway. It was over, again, I think in a minute and a half to two minutes. I went out onto the porch and again looked diagonally across the street and half of Steve's house was gone. Some of his guests had come out where the front door used to be or got to the threshold of it and hollered up, are you all right up there? I said, yes, are you all right down there? And in the affirmative. That was a blessing. There were no serious injuries that night. There could have been a lot of them. To my knowledge, there were no serious injuries on cleanup. Um, which moves me to the second part of what I want to say. The, uh, the damage to both the smaller home, smaller building where my wife has the gift shop, and our house was extensive. Uh, chimneys were busted off below the ridge pole lines four or five feet. <laughs> Bricks between the two houses all over the place. We didn't know it that that was that bad. We had uh, two wood stoves going, one in the kitchen and one in the large living room. Uh, no problem, there were no roofs to catch on fire, so we <laughs> 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 Part of the big house fell on the little house, then a big ash tree, and that sort of took care of the little house. The, um, after the initial shock and spending the night there, we had a formulated plan. Well, it was inch by inch because as we moved out the next day, and friends and relatives moved us by pickup down to my older son, our older son's home, which is a two-family in uh, Leeds section of Northampton. So that was convenient for us. It was only 10, 11 miles to get up here, and we were spending a lot of time up here in the next eight months. And um, the first goal was to clean up the driveway enough so that when people came to help, they had a place to put their vehicle. The debris looked like it looked like a war zone. And the next big hurdle was chasing to get the insurance adjusters in, which took far too long. And then it was just day in and day out. Um, that night, this is follow Steve's. Uh, um, mentioning the volunteers in town. Two firemen stopped in to make sure that we were okay and weren't injured and so on and so forth. And we're, we're very happy for that. About, not the first Saturday, I think it was two weeks after the occurrence, <coughs> excuse me, there was a work party that was set up to clean up the hollow. And we would, on our daily trip for eight months, we would come up uh, through Waitley, uh, West Waitley, and the reservoirs, and in on Waitley Road, to town here. And we came down by the swimming pool, and I, there was, a, 
I believe there was at least 45, if not 60, 65 people working, cleaning up the hollow sides of the streets and everything. That was a shot in the arm to our spirits. It really was. That uh, stuck with us a long time, because it was a long time getting back to where we are now. And the other thing was, with the backup of the uh, Fireman's Auxiliary and their help, uh, was we will be forever grateful. The um, the rebuilding, we feel whole. We're back to where we want to be. The structure is somewhat altered from the original. North and south gables are no longer on the big house, but quite honestly, we'd like the roof line the better the way it is now than, <laughs> than before. <laughs> but the price was too much. <laughs> The, uh, I can't think of much else other than uh, to restress the volunteers and the people that helped, and the community at large. It meant a great deal to us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One last thing, I'm sorry. We returned to our home eight months to the day after the tornado. No. Happily so. <laughs> Love to be back. <laughs> well, I was much luckier than many of my neighbors, and some of the old timers around said that, well, it's because you've got a slate roof, it's heavy. Uh, I did have a tree hit part of the roof and do some damage, um, but the, and the shed on the house was racked. Uh, pulled off the house from the same forces, in the same forces that twisted the bell tower off the church, grabbed my house and cracked plaster uh, throughout the building, uh, which uh, Tim uh, Morgan, back in the room, his brother, had been repairing for the last six or seven months. They're doing a great job. Um, but what I wanted to focus on is really what can we learn from this? Because um, I think there, I'm worried about the next time, not necessarily in Pumpkin Hollow, but um, I just want to say that the emergency response was terrific. Uh, and a couple days later, um, I called Dave Chichester, the emergency management director, and said, Dave, the, uh, the uh, emergency response is great. Who's coordinating the recovery phase? He said, and I know Dave well, he said, you and your neighbors. <laughs> and this was not a declared emergency. It didn't, I think it was $7.8 million it'd have to, is a threshold for FEMA to come in. And what I, what, my, what I and my neighbors learned over the next several months is there's no response. If, you, if you're under that $7.8 million, there is no state or federal aid available, or very little. Um, and the, it, unless it's a flood. After uh, Hurricane um, Irene, it turns out the Council of Governments has come up with some protocols for responding to, less, uh, to uh, disasters that, are, that don't hit that threshold. Um, and the determination that it was, uh, it was less than $7.8 million ignored the fact that it actually started in Goshen and traveled through Ashfield, uh, mm -hmm. through Conway, and then on to parts of Deerfield. In fact, by the time when they were making the determinations of the, of the value of the damage, they couldn't even see parts of it. They couldn't even get the parts of it. So that process was, was messed up. Um, what worked really well was the GoFundMe page. I really want to thank those of you who were involved in getting that started. That was great. Um, another thing that worked very well was something called the Emergency Forest Recovery Program of the Farm Service Agency of the USDA, uh, an agency I'd never heard of before. Their maps were so bad they couldn't tell that I didn't have a forest, and they were able to award me some money. <laughs> <laughs> they did is they, their guidelines are very broad and they were able to, they, they were determined to help, uh, help those of us uh, who had tremendous tree damage. For future reference, if a tree falls in your house, your insurance will cover it, removing it. Um, if a tree falls in your yard, it won't. I had 40, 35, 40, maybe 45 trees down and about to fall down all around my property, most of them not mine. And uh, there's nothing there's nothing for that. So um, finally, uh, we did do a cleanup. We organized a, uh, it was actually a week afterwards. Uh, we mm -hmm. 
uh, we organized a Facebook event and got about 60, 70, 80 people. It was great. And in two hours, they cleaned the street from 116 all the way down to the common. Um, it took us, and I, I spent a lot of time on the phone talking to people like, like the COG and uh, NEMA. NEMA is the, uh, NEMA is the Massachusetts version of FEMA. Uh, they, the, although they will provide resources and the state will provide resources to towns to clear roads and so forth and so on, there is no, no resources whatsoever available to private, to individual owners of property unless it had been a declared emergency. Uh, we did, through MEMA, get in, in touch with a group called Team Rubicon, which is a group of veterans and volunteers who came, who showed up, I think it was on May 24th, uh, and they spent two and a half days with some one piece of heavy equipment and lots of chainsaws, and they, uh, they brought a lot of this, these down trees and limbs to the roadside for later chipping, and that was invaluable. You know, that was several thousand dollars worth of work uh, which I benefited from. Um, and then um, a few weeks after that, we, a bunch of us got together and, and got uh, Jim's tree service. Jim Sessions' uh, father actually uh, used to live in the house just north of me, and uh, Fred Graves. And so he had a sort of soft spot for uh, Conway and, and the locale. So he made available his tree chipping service at a very reasonable rate. and. We cleaned uh, up stuff from seven properties in a marathon six-hour session, which broke all the OSHA rules about how you need to <laughs> um, The one thing I, I would say that needs to happen, and, was, and I, I want to mention this, and I, I want to be, uh, I've been trying to, I'm, being, I'm, thought, I'm trying to be thoughtful about this, but the big problem uh, was it was very difficult to find anyone in the town uh, and we had uh, Dave Chichester helping us, um, who would be the point person for requests of our volunteer efforts. For example, we had the chipper, we wanted to get the road closed. And we called everyone we could think of in town, but never, we never got any cones, and the road was never closed. And that was sort of problematic. It turns out a big chipper is enough to slow down people, but it, <laughs> you know, it still was a little bit dangerous because people didn't know that uh, it was a construction or deconstruction. So. Um, so I think that's, that's a major concern uh, from my standpoint is if it's, this is going to happen again, we need to ha find a way for the town to have a point person to relate to the volunteer effort. It was, it was very awkward. I just, I'll be, be honest about it. It was very awkward several times uh, trying to communicate with the town a about how we might work. Uh, getting uh, the Team Rubicon folks uh, permission to have dinners in this old town hall took several days of negotiation. So somehow we need to find a way to clean up uh, that aspect of things. So, and, and uh, also uh, the other part that needs work is at the COG, the Franklin uh, Regional COG. They have committees after Irene that set up all sorts of protocols for responding to floods, but they've not done the same thing for wood, for uh, ice and wind damage. And they need to, and I and others have offered um, to work with them. And uh, I hope something can happen in that, that regard. Thank you. Well, I live up on 116, and um, like Steve said, the noise was incredible. I went to my picture window, and I'm like, what are, the, what are the tractor trailers coming down the road for? I'm like, what is that noise? And then the lights went out, and you could hear stuff hitting the house, and then I saw our shed go flying by the front window. <laughs> and I, so I ran into the back of the house, and my husband's downstairs, and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, I, I don't know. There's stuff hidden everywhere. I ran into my back room, and first thing I said is, I'm thinking, cover your head. If anything falls, just cover your head. And so I got on the floor, and I was just trying to find a place to be small. And uh, my husband got me into a doorway, and then a tree just hit the back of our house, and then rain was pouring in. And I'm just, I'm screaming like, we're going to die, we're going to die. <laughs> you don't want me to be in a tornado, because I'll totally panic. But, uh, so, and then the telephone pole came down with the, um, the big transformer, and my husband said there's this huge light. And he thought, okay, that's it, we're done, we're done. And then it was, um, it was over like that, it was really fast. But the noise was just incredible. 
And then when you start going outside and and then I'm thinking, you know, if the house crashes down, what do you what do you say? What do you bring with you? And I grab my son's military picture, I grab, you know, just crazy stuff. But we had to go under wires, we had to go over logs to get out of our driveway. And this is right up on 116. And from the front our house didn't look bad, but from the back, it was, we must have had six, seven trees, I think. Our little camper got squished, um, two cars. Um, it was just crazy. And then my sister-in-law took us in down here, but it was just, I have to say in the aftermath was just, you shine a light up 116, you couldn't even see the road, there was trees everywhere, it was just, and if I never have to stack wood ever again in my life, <laughs> I'll be totally happy. But, um, that was just, we're just glad no one was hurt, and I tell you what, the next day the firemen were up on our roof removing the tree, helping us, um, friends and family came up, we got our yard cleaned, um, it was, yeah, the help was incredible, yeah. so that was my kind of experience. Yes. Thank you, thank you all for I'm the fire chief in Tonic County, and uh, we started off the exciting Saturday evening about 7.30. I was at, my wife and I were home. We had two grandchildren up. I have a cathedral ceiling home that faces right over the center of town, up past the bank on the hillside. And we started to hear the wind blow, like the rest of us in town did. We didn't think nothing of it. Then it got harder, then it got harder. And all of a sudden we heard this friendly locomotive coming. And everybody says, Sounds like a train. Well, folks, it really sounds like a train. You go by by this ferry road or somewhere and stand right next to the tracks and listen to them coming, you'll get the same impression of this tornado. I quickly ran to the living room my two grandchildren visiting that night, grabbed them and run to the middle of the house because I figured we have a cathedral ceiling all glass doors and windows. I figured it's all coming in in the house. I just thought it was going to come in. It was blowing that high. By the time I grabbed the two children and ran into the kitchen where my wife was in the middle of the house, the lights went out, my fire pager took off crazy, started alerting us all, and it was all gone. That matter of, like you said, seconds. Uh, the fire pager went off, mainly, to alert the firemen that we had an injured party down by the library in a car that was passing through town, and a tree limb went through the back window of the car, and there was somebody injured in the car. So I quickly left the children with my grandchildren and my wife. I said, I'm going to go, I'll go get town down before the truck, fire trucks can get there. I got downtown to find this car was in front of the town hall parked. The rear window totally blown into the back seat of the car. <coughs> Young teenage lady, uh, her fa father and her little sister was in the front seat. The other girl was in the back seat, screaming bloody murder. I figured, oh my God, she's seriously hurt. We've got the animals coming too. To find out, she was covered with glass. I helped brush the glass off her. She didn't have a scratch on her. She was just not hurt, not injured. She was just plain scared to death. They thought the devil was after them, they said. So, and as I was waiting on her, uh, a couple of other firemen came down. Uh, Ronnie Hawks was one of them. I know a lot of you know Ron Hawks. And we had dispatch center called us on the radio and said, this isn't the only problem you've got. <laughs> there problems in the way they roll pumpkin hollow area of your, of, your hall, of your town. So we got uh, reports of the McDonald house being damaged and some problems down on Whaley Road further. So they got up there and Ronnie called me. I was still wor wor working on the girl in the, in the back seat of the car, getting her to calm down so we could kind of release her. Her father and, and uh, Ronnie said, called me on the radio and said, Chief, we got real serious problems up here. I can't even get down with you, right? He said, and I'm not lying to you, he said, there's four by eight sheets of plywood in the road, laying flat down on the road with all the nails sticking up in the air. Oh. He said, I can't drive to even begin to get down in my pickup. Sounds like my roof. It could have been. <laughs> Who's <laughs> it was? Well, anyway, so I, I 
quickly said to him, you know, we got to get organized, we got to get start growing from house to house. But at this point, we didn't still know it was a tornado. Yeah. We kind of thought maybe it was a big microburst, because we've had microbursts in town before. It came the same path about 15, 18 years ago, on off of Cranky Hill into Bumpkin Hollow. Steve yeah. remembers, yes, it was before you even know, lived there. And uh, tore some trees down, stuff like that, uh, microburst. Same, very similar path. Um, and then he said, I said, geez, where's the rest of my firemen? And we said, oh my God, the uh, ice, ice uh, hockey team in, in Springfield had a uh, first responders free night <laughs> days on it problem. And we had eight of our firefighters who went down to it. So we're shorthanded by eight. And, and then the other people live in the outlines of town, like the center of, up toward Shelvin Falls and stuff like that, or down toward Boyden Road and 116, they're not coming up the town. I said, I can't understand what's going on. They learn to find out the roads are all closed. You're sure we had an enormous amount of damage in county center, but we had all the damages throughout the town that we weren't aware of at first. So a few of us were able to go down to Steve and, and, and all the rest of the people live here. And nice to talk here today at their homes. Make sure that you got to go to, got to rush, get through these homes as fast as you can, meet with the people, make sure they're all right, they're not injured, and then move on. We'll try to pick up pieces later, but we've got to make sure that all the residents are safe. So that's what they did. They went door to door, asking everybody if they were safe and stuff. And then the calls started coming in. Um, we got a call from a gentleman on Matthews Road in South Deerfield in the county that a tree went through the roof of his house. So we couldn't get there. I had called to the mutual aid system, had South Deerfield come up. And they said, would you come up and check, see if you can assist these people? Maybe they're here in the room. I don't know if they are not. But, uh, assist these people and then move, to try to move toward the center county as best you can. I said, because we can't get out of the center town. Our emergency services people were trapped in the center town like you folks were. <clears throat> we just couldn't drive out of town. Uh, Ken Matt was out of town. He tried to get back in. The police chief, he got as far as the Savings Bank. Uh, and a bunch of other people with John O'Rourke. I called John O'Rourke to try to activate our EOC, our operational center at the town hall. He couldn't get in any further than the Savings Bank. Uh, after he met with Ken Matt and stuff, they decided that, well, let's try going back down and go all over Matthews and Graves and come up this way into Ridge Bridge in town. They managed to get into town that way. Going around a lot of debris in the roads, of course. But, um, we also received a call from a couple that lives up on Main Polar Road, way up near the Williamsburg Road area, where they had a tree go through the roof of their garage. They were sticking in the garage. We had to, I had to send Ashfield to that one because these people don't know if they got shorts and wiring and the house could catch fire, so we got to get people out of this stuff. So we had that happen. Uh, then we got all the calls from the Shelvin Falls in, that the roads are blocked, nobody can get through, there's wires down, uh, wires aren't going to spark in. So we had Shelvin Falls come in from that end of town, and they could only get in a waste before they had to stop too. So all this is going on in a matter of the first half to three quarters of an hour. But the most important that we felt at the time was, you know, was to get this pumpkin hollow straightened out first. Just make sure everybody's safe. <coughs> Shortly after, when I was working on the girl in the car, getting the glass out of, out of her eyes and, and, and off her clothes, we also got another call that somebody, now I don't, don't know where this came from, we got a call that somebody was trapped in the second story bedroom on Whiteley Road. I don't know where it came from. We never did find that out. But well, luckily, after our firemen we managed to get down through all the debris in the houses, get them to find out that that was not a true fact. <laughs> and uh, one of my firemen said to me, you know, I saw the funniest thing, it was kind of a, a laughter, not laughter, he said, uh, it was kind of a, made my life a little, little easier, he said, going from house to house and all this damage, he says, when I got down in front of Steve's house, Steve, you may not know this, I don't think I ever told you this. <laughs> he said, it was either your cat or some family cat and they were standing out in the road like this, going like... <laughs> <laughs> like what the heck? I, 
<laughs> probably came out of one of the second stories of Mr. Snyder's or your house. Probably my cat. The first time the cat showed up, you could ring it out and get about a pint of wood. Now, sat, the cat was out there, just about totally disoriented in the middle of the road. He said, I would try to pick it up, and I finally realized that somebody was near it, and it, you know, it kind of spruced up a little bit. But he said, this cat was like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> Stop to think about it. The cat's in the house and the house gets blown away. <laughs> you know, it kind of makes you wonder what's going on. So, well, anyway, we got the, we have the, uh, we activated our EOC. We put out to uh, 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 get the ball rolling for all the help we needed because we knew we were going to have many, many, many hours of, of, of uh, set up and uh, trying to get roads. I think it was a total of 15 or 18 roads. They were totally closed in Conway after that storm hit. Not only did the tornado come off the Cricket Hill, from Ashford Goshen down into Cricket Hill, bounced through Pumpkin Hollow, went up through uh, by Charlie Alice's house up above the savings bank. You can see that big swath up there. It came down over Greg Rose's house by our salt shed, the Fournier property, tore the chimneys off of his roof, bricks off his chimney, and took the roof off our salt shed and continued on down to Deerfield Matthews Road and uh, so on. I found out after, uh, weeks after, talking with the people from the National Weather Service, they had remnants of the, the storm traced as far northeast of here as Northfield. Wow. We're part of it. What's wrong? Um, when we remembered them, I said, you know, what do you think? And he says, well, he says, I think it's not a microburst. <laughs> he said, and I'm going to find this out because they wanted, they came out to look at it. And he said, I don't, uh, I, I'm guessing it's a uh, number one tornado. And I said, he said, probably wind speeds 110 to 120 miles an hour. And then there was another National Weather guy with him. He said, but you didn't see what I saw, he said. So I need to take you back out to what I saw. He says, I think it was a category two tornado which puts wind speeds up to 150 miles an hour. <clears throat> so after they did all their calculations, they got back to us and said, no, nope, we've decided it was a high class one tornado. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't enough high speed damage over 150 miles, up to 150 miles an hour to determine it was a class two tornado. So we were lucky that way. I don't know if there's any luck to it, but <laughs> lucky that way. But anyway, we've gotten a lot of support why this was all going on, the Latin Alliance Association of Chalma and Greenville and Franklin County came out and assisted us, and assisted a bunch of the people with uh, uh, some badly needed items they, they needed. Uh, we had uh, some groups from Springfield, some, uh, I don't know, it was a church group, it was, kids were involved in it. They did a fun drive and they got the whole bunch of stuff that came up that was distributed out to people. Uh, the people from Conway, and the Shovel Falls and all the surrounding towns were great, but the townspeople were probably the most fabulous of all of us. Uh, because of the emergency services personnel that are out there on the streets trying to get the roads opened up, and so we could get Conway somewhat back to normal, so we could try to get the electricity all back on. Also came in from um, um, the Diffland, and these people would uh, like to uh, said to me, what can we help? Well, we had about 130 to 140 people working up here between the light companies and all emergency responders people. The uh, Western Mass uh, uh, DCR was in town, the Department of the Conservation and Recreation brought in their tree crews to help us and stuff like that. And it was all a, a great response. So the townspeople that asked for if they could help, we don't have a lot for them to do, but they came out with food which was a wonderful thing. Stop and think about this. For 48 hours, you have these 140 people in your town. They've got to have food and drink, or they can't keep going. So, between Eversource had, the, had fought, food bought in for their people, they bought that to the town hall, plus all the other town residents in town that supported the, with a lot of food. It was like a giant smorgasbord. It really was. <laughs> it, was it was really a wonderful thing for people to have available to them. And we'd ship the crews off, every so often and have them come in and get food and drink. And then if they couldn't get in, we'd try to get it out to them. So that's basically what went on. 
Um, but like I said, we did, I want to speak just a little bit about uh, uh, Grant's comment on, we need to have a point person put together in case a tornado like this happens again. And I understand what Grant, Grant's coming through, and we did have a little bit of discussion in town uh, nothing formal, but a little bit of discussion in town, and I think uh, uh, Mrs. Sweet can talk, comment on this a little better than I can. Uh, we, she asked and recommended that we put a committee together, correct? Or some sort of committee? Or? Well, I, informally, because I was getting um, lots of requests from people about um, volunteering, and there was a lot of people that used to live in town. Um, I just didn't know how to direct that. So with Heidi, um, you know, I was kind of helping her out, um, just doing whatever I could, if, if there was any phone calls setting up at the uh, grammar school. Um, but there has been, um, since then, um, with the emergency management, um, I have been um, put on as the volunteer coordinator. So there is something being put in place that hopefully in the future you need somebody in town or a group of people in town that can coordinate help from all the public that wants to help in no matter what grant said, any any way, shape or manner. Whether it's give an hour here, give an hour there, or anything you can do. Because that's very important in a situation like this. They don't realize that, but it is very, very important. So we're hopefully gonna work on that and uh, come up with that group and probably ask for volunteers. I don't know how you're gonna do it, but it, it's definitely a work in progress. I, mean, work I went progress. to um, a workshop just a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago uh, in Greenfield that Burkhog put on. Mm -hmm. So, and it, you know, it's pretty much right about what you do for volunteer coordinating. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're just touching on it, but lots of information at hand. Okay. So we had a real good support group, the whole town of Collin, behind all of us. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, we never had one negative comment from any resident about the way it went on because it's it's something we in the fire service have had training on pre-planning for little incidents i mean as bad as county was thank god it wasn't as big as that one that went through springfield yeah. we made the months of them going that way uh, we're just fortunate we had a small dose of that but we can see what that small dose does to our community compared to uh, the bigger, bigger tornadoes. Do you want to see something? I'm Dave Shields and I'm here because I went to this community to the Lions Club. Within a very short period of time, I called my district governor, who lives in Connecticut, and within three days we had $10,000. Um, it was the discretion of the district governor where the money is going. And I know you people, you know, Tom, and Thomas and uh, we come over and uh, assess the area Wednesday, and I can't believe how be upbeat the town was. I mean, it, everybody was welcoming it to us, and we'll do it a heartbeat every year. And to say, um, Lions Club, over a period of time since we've had our foundation, we've given $118 million to disaster relief. So, Anytime you guys have a disaster, we're going to put in for that money. So, um, I, told, I told Heidi, you guys did such a job. I said, we want in on the 250th, and we did. We brought in a 38-foot motor home. Um, we set it down by the um, library, and we had a great time. So, and I told Heidi, anytime you have a fundraiser, let me know. Thank you. I mean, when you, when you have a turkey dinner, that's a okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Helen and Bob, I've known Bob for, what, 50 years, Bob? From the fire, ser <laughs> fire service. And uh, I think tonight at 6 o'clock, um, Channel 40 will be doing another video on the, the uh, storm. I don't know if anybody's seen it yet, but... Uh, um, Jacob Wyckoff did it, and Bob's in it. Again tonight, and uh, 20 is supposed to have something on 2020. Yeah, but uh, they did it. They did an excellent job, and but uh, I enjoy working with this community. There was uh, we had the Monday, Monday, Tuesday. We came in an assessment on Wednesday. 
we handed out some of the monies the following Monday. Thanks to Heidi, she gave us the opportunity to meet some of these nice people that were affected. And uh, like you said, the telephone pole, that was literally splinters. I got pictures of that. And, uh, um, you know, but hopefully things are, it's, it's upbeat. You guys are so upbeat, I can't believe it. I'm originally from Charlemont. And uh, to see you people work versus those people, it's. <laughs> <laughs> when you put in the newspaper that you can't find volunteers, it's, uh, it's pretty sad. But I mean, I worked with Bob and we, we had a great time. And, uh, you know, when you guys can do a, a show like you did for the 250s, I was, it was awesome. So I'd like to thank you all for doing a fine job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't ever said this in a crowd before. I think it's time to say it. As all of us endure in these disasters like this, and all the people thank the firemen and the first responders for everything they do, also we need to think about the first responders themselves because they leave their property, their domains, to go help other people, not knowing whatever took place in their own homes. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, that same night, we had a group of firefighters that came back from their, they left their, whole, their show early because they got text messages on their telephones about the storm economy. They got back home, they helped us in Whaley Road and everyone else. Uh, they held family off for the uh, Cricket Hill Road, old Cricket Hill Road, that passed up at the transfer station. They went to go home and their road was totally blocked for thousands of feet of trees just like this. And they had trees on the roofs of their homes and everything else. They didn't even know they had damage until mm -hmm. they went to go home the next day. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to think about them too because they're out there giving their whole life support for all of us. And uh, we should think about them when they're out there sometime. It's just a very important thing. Um, Last but not least, I gotta tell you this part of the story. I, nobody's ever heard this from before, but <laughs> after being helping out the town's people for 48 hours straight from six, seven o'clock Saturday evening to nine o'clock Sunday night, around the clock, we sent the guys home. I got Williamsburg to cover our fire station so our firefighters could try to get some sleep and rest. I had South Denver covering the east end of town, Shelburne Falls covering the west end of town. It's time to go home and get some rest. I goes up my driveway to my house, which is right up the street here. There's an Eversource pickup parked in my doorway. <laughs> the guy says, hi, sir. He goes, do you live here? I says, yes, I do. He says, I've got some good news for you and some bad news. <laughs> and I said, well, what's the bad news first? He says, you're not going to have your electricity on for at least a week. Okay. And he said, because the neighbor's plant tree blew down in your back door, yard, knocked a transformer on the ground or the pole, snapped the pole off. This transformer spilled all its guts all over your lawn. <laughs> now we need to get construction companies to come in and dig your lawn all up, take all this stuff away. And I said, okay, I'm dead tired. I said, that, that's the best you could do? Well, he says, I haven't told you the good news yet. And I said, is there really any good news? And he goes, yes, there is. Eversource has got a big generator headed your way as I speak. Oh. And within the next hour or so, we should have your house up and running for you. Mm -hmm. And they pulled him the trailer, like, buddy, this big, huge trailer, big monstrous thing. Two guys jumped out of the truck, they run up the wires up on my lawn, put them onto my meter, in 10 minutes time, boom, my house lights right up, beautiful. <laughs> Furnaces come back on, because it was cold then, and everything else. So, the last part of the dilemma is, I gotta tell you this too. <laughs> Every source sent a construction crew to my house to pick up the oil. In the process of digging my lawn off, they snapped my well head off to my well <laughs> and filled my well solid full of mud. I mean, I got a 175 foot deep well. I used and drew them well. And I came home that afternoon, they were just trying to load equipment. I says, 
He said, well done, sir. I'll send for you. I said, that's nice, but where's my wealth? <laughs> that guy goes, what are you talking about? It's just supposed to be right there. <laughs> so we were without water, my wife and I, for four weeks. Oh. And we got straightened out. They sent the company in, and they pumped the wells out. We couldn't drink the water. After the water was back on, we couldn't. We couldn't drink it for four weeks because you wouldn't believe the color of the water was. And it stunk something terrible for four weeks. But anyway, that's our own personal story. But I just want to let you know that I really want to thank everybody in town for everything you did because it makes you feel proud to be in common. Thank you, man. Thank you. I think it's worth um, noting, too, that when you think of Conway, we kind of forget how spread out we are here. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big town in terms of, of how many square miles we are, and not all that many people. And I think for the, the emergency crews to go to every house was pretty incredible that night to check on all of us. And not, not an easy thing for all of them. So thank you so much for all that, that you did. Um, and all the other people that were involved in that. Um, the good news, bad news. The bad news is our, we still have our, our technical problems are persisting. These are mostly videos that are available on YouTube, so you can all go home and see them anyway. Just punch in Conway and the tornado, and you can see them, and they'll be, it sounds like there's something on the local news tonight anyway. Um, we'll leave the computer up here afterwards if you want to see what Phil has lined up um, once we sort of break apart and having refreshments and all that, and we can have that running. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of open it up to all of you, and, and our panelists can answer questions. I, I wonder if somebody is here from the church congregation that would want to update us on the church, feel feel like they can speak for the church at all, um, or anybody that has a special knowledge of that right now and, and where we are with all of that. We're is there somebody waiting. here still waiting on it? I mean, the, the news I've heard doesn't sound good. No, it's not. So most likely the scenario is that it has to be torn down? I, we don't know sorry. for sure. I was hoping somebody else would be here, but I guess they didn't make it to me. Um, if anyone knows more, they can share that with, with others during our question time. Does anybody else have other questions for the panelists or for Bob or anybody else? Um, somebody said way back when that Lee Whitcomb was making a map of some sort. Of I'm, I'd be fascinated to see a, a copy of that kind of because my impression is that we didn't even know everything that had happened for quite. It, often somebody's Woodlots, right. Walter Goodrich, I mean other... The Council of Governments did a map for they us. They did. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just showed the path of the tornado coming into Conway. Wasn't and that... The, and the reported damaged locations on it. It's nothing famished to look at, but it is, it's not bad. And then yeah. there's a copy of it in the town hall, and I'm hoping that they can get... I think there's two copies available. I'm hoping they, they should be able to get one from the historical society. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 it's, a, it's a very well put together map of county, yeah. and there's yeah. pictures yeah. of the damaged yeah. areas, houses and stuff around the outside of it. Right, right. Yes. And, and it was at the 250 of, in the grammar school. Uh -huh. It was on, it was, yeah. on tables, yeah. Uh -huh. It was interesting to see. Yeah. He was trying to get to get a Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, if we could get it, if you could, okay, if you could make sure we get a copy of that yeah. at some point, that'd be great. Um, I mean, if you sold copies, we. <laughs> okay. No, I, yeah. I, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems like it, it did touch down in so many different places yeah. in town. We're we're way out on Beach Road, on the other side of town, and we lost a huge um, uh, evergreen tree. Yeah. You know, they just a massive tree that you can't believe came down like that. We didn't know it until we went outside. We didn't hear it. Yeah. Uh, I um, mean, that happened all over town. And, I I lost a huge tree that hit my garage. Yeah. And and my grandson's brand new $40,000 truck, a tree went right through wow. it. Um, I'm on fire auxiliary. I never even, we never even realized anything really had happened until the next day when Ron Sweet drove by yeah. and said that the whole town was a mess. I never called the fire department. We just picked up our yard all day Sunday. Mm. We didn't even know. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like there's something incredibly, I hate to anthropomorphize. <laughs> Uh, a natural weather event, but something really sinister about tornadoes in that, I mean, they're so unpredictable, and it's almost like they're discriminating. You know, they, they took out the mag's barn, but didn't touch the house, kind of thing. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. I think other natural storms and events and weather events 
are more consistent. <laughs> you know, hurricanes <laughs> tend to flatten everything in their yeah. path. <laughs> but for it to jump around like that, I think that's what's... Yeah, so, I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes. <coughs> I'm a resident of Conway, but my husband and I were here when that happened. We were in South Carolina on our way home. We were on vacation. And like any good computer geek, I got on Facebook in the morning. And I... Oh, no, that evening, and I heard, I read from Julie Sweet, oh my God, what was that? I hope I never go through that again. And I thought, Bob, something happened in town. I have no idea what it is, and I couldn't find anything. I tried to private message Julie. Of course, she couldn't answer me. I tried to call my neighbor. I tried to call my other neighbor. Nobody could answer me. I couldn't see anything happen. I didn't know what was going on. And then the next morning, on my way home, we were in a motel on our way home, I turned the news on and Conway was on the news. <laughs> and I said, I need to find somebody I can talk to. I need to know if my neighbors are safe. I need to know, is everybody okay? Um, I put in another call to my neighbor, still couldn't get through. The following day, she called me back from Amherst and because she was able to get phone connection and she said we're fine we're safe we weren't hit but you can't get home <laughs> i said what do you mean i can't get home she said there's no road open for you to get into conway and i said well what can we do she said stay at the red roof inn when you get there so <laughs> when we got to new york city she called me and she said, you can get up 116 and you can get home. Mm. So that's what it's like when you're not here yeah. and you know that something terrible has happened in your town and you can't reach anybody. Thank mm. God nobody was hurt, mm. but that's just another perspective mm. of the tornado when you can't get any news. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Show you how you know. small yes. the little town you count as you would think. We had a report. Uh, within the first 24 hours of, of people that used to live in Conway, they're living in Hawaii, and it was on the television in Hawaii. <laughs> the picture of the damage in Conway. Within the first 24 hours. So a lot of people are talking about all of the volunteers, and uh, one of the people who is an amazing volunteer is sitting right here, Patricia. And uh, she said, no, no. But so Sunday morning, you know, our, our town administrator was on vacation. He was down in Puerto Rico. And, and so Bob has had a lot of training in emergency stuff, but John and I, you know, it's like we suddenly had 50 people all bivouacked in, in the town hall with desks and doing stuff, and it was hard to know what to do. And Patricia walked up and said, I understand your town administrator is on vacation. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, well, I might be able to help. And she's a town administrator in Situate, right? Or just wow. retired. Yeah. And uh, where they do many of these every year. You know, they, so she led us through how to handle a disaster like this all day Sunday. Maybe not all night, Sunday night. All day Monday, she took the day off of work. <clears throat> Finally, she went back to Situate on Tuesday. And I don't know what we would have done without you. Uh, every, every step of the way, she would say, okay, the press is going to be here at 11 o'clock because they need to have the news at this time, and they're going to want to know about this detail. So you can talk about this, but don't talk about this. And then at 3 o'clock, she'll say, no, they're going to come in. The press will be here for some more. The press were vultures. And, uh, anyway, every step of the way, she knew exactly what we needed to do next. I really don't know what we would have done if you hadn't stepped up. And poor, John, uh, poor Tom Hutchinson, our town administrator, John would have had the best lesson of his life if you could have worked with John, uh, Tom. Uh, because he wasn't here and he would call now and then from Puerto Rico and you know, hope he was having some margaritas down there. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. To add to the animal levity or, or, or reaction, we were trying to get home from Shelburne Falls and we coming up Shelburne Falls Road and there was no way. There was a police officer out there or a fireman or 
somebody who just was doing a good deed and put us back to Sheldon Falls. We tried to get the back way to Ashfield and that did not work. <laughs> Went all the way back through 91 and I thought you can never get up the 116 curve. So I was not feeling good about getting home to check on the horses in the barn that I was worried about. And we actually went up and over Boyden Road. Um, Tom Rovanovic just about ran me over to get back to town, <laughs> on the way back from Springfield. <laughs> but uh, in the Phoebe Porter's field and then in the cornfield on Graves and Reef Bridge, there were more deer than you could ever imagine. And they were all standing there like bug eyed. Like, don't go in there. <laughs> like, something is crazy in the woods. And they were all just looking at us like, wow, you won't believe what just and It was every, every big field we went through. It was full of deer just looking like, wow, man, that was crazy. We're glad to be out here, but it was really, we knew that something was wrong. And the only reason we got it, I don't know if you know this, a neighbor was out with his chainsaw. So he's the one that actually cut the path to get up through Reeves Bridge. And we didn't even, we saw the trees cut, but, you know, and luck we had the trees down and back at the barn. The barn stood. And the horses probably didn't even know what happened, but the deer didn't. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to share or questions for any of our panelists? So, um, just like to say that I think the Historical Society's one-room schoolhouse in front of the grammar school was perhaps the last structure to be damaged on its way out of town. It was minor. It was minor, but we did lose the chimney cap, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, Charlie Marsh for, for fixing it. Uh, yes. Did, did you ever find the cap? Uh, I don't. Did, did we find the cap? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah Charlie, Charlie put it back on for us. I don't about know the, about the distance of a good frisbee toss from where the chimney was. Um, and, and just one other thing, the, the, I, the cliche is always it sounded just like a train, a freight train, and I always sort of doubted that cliche. Yeah. But, um, it, and I would just like to describe that, the, the, the quality, did, it didn't just sound like a freight, it sounded like exactly like the freight train that you know and that you recognize. And that's what really threw us off. We went outside on the porch just because the light was just so it was so unusual, and um, and it sounded you know from from the middle of Conway. You occasionally hear the distant Bardwell's Ferry train, and it sounded just like that, except louder and more, more <laughs> like it was in our driveway. And so that that really is an, an appropriate description. Uh, I just wanted to say my grandson is now. He grew up in this town. He just moved in October. He's 26. He is now an engineer on a freight train. And he had just come home with his fiance from dinner. And he came into the TV room where I was and he said, I hear a freight train. I said, that's a tornado. We didn't even have time to get downstairs. We were on the second floor. <coughs> you should know what a freight train sounds like. <laughs> 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 Anybody else have anything to share or ask me, any of our panelists? Um, if you want me to explain a little, let me explain a little bit about the what took place that I know about. Not not much, but how how, how the uh, division of the money that was put into the Go GoFundMe and the final money stock Missouri uh, savings account at the bank was put together for the Excuse me. tornado relief fund. And all total, they collected a little over 110 or 15,000, I think it was, uh, which was tremendous and outpouring of money. Then come the task of how do you distribute the money? So what the auxiliary did is, uh, my daughter Heidi, she, we met with them, and she came and met with the stockman, and we said, you know, the town can have no ties to this money whatsoever. Uh, we can't help assist in, in giving it out. We can't uh, handle the money in any way, shape, or manner. It has to be totally private. So they found five citizens in, in the town of Conway that had no storm damage, are on no committees, and have no connection to the town of Conway other than living here. They were able to find those five people. I have no idea who they were. And none of us ever want to know who they were. And they very secretively met. They knew what they had for money. 
they put the applications out, people sending applications for damaged properties and stuff like that. They got all that together uh, and they distributed the money. They made up some sort of formula as how they were going to distribute the money. And it was all the penny of it was distributed out to the residents that had damage in the county. And I think that was a wonderful way of doing it. Because that way they had nobody can come back and say, Oh, I don't know, how come my neighbor might have got a little more than I did or something like that. We have no idea what people got. We don't want to know what got. All we want to know is that the money that was given went back to the people that had tornado damage. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Well, I thought there was another criteria for the people that got on this committee. They all had to have a dry cat. Was that true? <laughs> <laughs> a dry cat. <laughs> a dry cat, yeah. That's, okay. That's how that came down. I thought you might want to be, know about that, because probably a lot of you donated to the fund. I know uh, uh, us, me and my wife and everybody, all these fundraisers and stuff that came in and stuff, for uh, a tremendous outpouring of funds, and I, I'm sure they went to the appropriate There use. was one condition for receiving help from that funds and it was that you have damage over one thousand okay. dollars. If it was under the replication was not accepted. Okay. Well it didn't take much more over a thousand dollars. Thanks for Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank uh, everyone in our panel who spoke today and shared their experiences. I know that's not the easiest thing in the world, so thank you so much for doing that. Thanks all for coming. Uh, we have a lot of food, and if you want to hang out and talk more and ask other people questions, you're welcome to. You can also look at some of the, um, the video footage on the computer. We'll put that up here on the table if anyone wants to see it.